there, Lillian? Yeah, so that's Lillian. So if you hit the three <laughs> little dots at the top of her picture and then pin, it'll say pin video, then you can just see her. Um, and she shared her video. So we should be off. We've got 15 people here now. Um, I'm going to kind of just keep checking in and on or mute people if you've unmuted. Obviously, if you have a question for her, she's going to have questions she'll ask at the end. So if you can just save that question. And um, yeah, for now, we're just, uh, we'll let you take it away, Lillian. All right. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much, everybody, for inviting me into your home to um, go through this workshop. I thought this was a pretty appropriate workshop for the times that we're in. We're going to talk about how to keep your immune system strong to fight not only COVID, but other infectious diseases. The fact of the matter is we don't live in a sterile environment. So I hope you're all staying safe. Um, you know, I've been working at the hospital every single day, and the good news is we're actually seeing less patients come through the ER and through ICU. So we're really happy about that. But, you know, we have to put these procedures in place with social distancing and hand washing, et cetera. And of course, keeping our immune system strong. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, of course, I have to give you a little bit of the physiology and the anatomy of the immune system, because in order for us to understand what I'm talking about when I say, oh, eat this to keep your killer cells strong, you need to understand what a killer cell is. So we're going to give you a little bit of a background on that. I'm going to go through certain things that, or certain conditions that can actually hurt the immune system. And then we'll talk about foods and nutrients that naturally boost the immune system. So first, we have to define immunity and the immune system. What is it? Well, immunity is actually our body's um, defense system. It's our ability to resist all the creepy crawlies and the obnoxious things in the environment and also internally as well. So we're fighting off cancer cells. We're fighting off viruses, bacteria, environmental pollutants. We're fighting that off every minute of our life. It's just when it overcomes and they replicate faster than we can fight it off, do we actually actually get sick. So I know this is a crazy slide and I promise there isn't going to be an exam at the end of this workshop, but this is something I always show my medical students. Um, obviously they need to know anatomy and physiology. So when you look at the immune system, it's actually a very complicated system. Um, and thank goodness because, you know, we've got a lot of things that we need to fight. But I wanted to show you just some um, key words here. So you've got T cells, because I'm going to talk a lot about what T cells are. And T cells are part of the immune system. And they are broken up into different types of cells, like the helper cells, the suppressor cells, the cytotoxic cells, and the memory cells. So just kind of keep that in mind when I say T cells. And also keep in mind the B cells. The B cells actually make antibodies. So plasma cells is just a fancy name for antibodies. And I want you to also pay attention to this one, natural killer cells, which sounds so crazy, but thank goodness we have these natural killer cells in our immune system because these in particular um, fight off viruses. So we wanna eat foods that really strengthen our natural killer cells. And then when you go on this side, You've got the monocytes, and one of the most important monocyte is a macrophage, and I'm going to tell you why. Uh, this macrophage actually begins the whole cascade of the immune system. So again, we want to eat foods that keep those macrophages very strong. So I'm going to go through what does that. And then, of course, you have other white blood cells. So I know this looks like a crazy slide, but this is basically the uh, tissues and the cells that are responsible for our immune system. And thank goodness we have lots of backup because we have a lot of things in the environment and internally that we have to fight off. So this is just a copy of one of my patient's CBCs. When you get a CBC, a complete blood count from the doctor, it's going to tell you the total amount of, of white blood cells, and white blood cells is what gives us that immunity and fights off um, infection. Your red blood cells, hemoglobin, hematocrit, platelets, and these are a bunch of different white blood cells as well lymphocytes, monocytes. So that's what the doctor is looking at when he looks at your CBC. He's looking at the entire profile. And as you can see, this patient looked like everything was normal. All right, so you have um, 
different processes of the immune system. One is called innate. In other words, we're born with it. We don't have to do anything about it. It's just going to confer protection. So I'm going to give you an example of what that is. And then you've got acquired or adaptive, very specific immune system. So when you hear um, on the news or the scientists talk about, you know, do we have antibodies to COVID? Well, that would be a type of acquired immunity because we've been exposed to something new. So did our body, can our body actually recognize it, make antibodies to fight it off? Um, so that would be a type of acquired immunity. So innate immunity would be something that's nonspecific. And a good example of that would be our skin. Our skin, you know, one of the functions of the skin is to have that protective barrier to um, protect us from anything invading. That's why whenever you even have a little cut, that can actually cause infection because now you've broken that barrier and things can get into your blood system. So the skin is very, very important. So take care of your skin, keep it nice and supple, um, keep it nice and soft, take a look at it. If you have any cuts or bruises or abrasions and you're going out in the environment, especially these days, you might want to wear gloves just to protect your skin since it, it might not be intact. The other thing is you, we've got a low pH of our skin too. And what that is our sweat glands and our oil glands. And bacteria doesn't really like, certain bacteria anyway, don't like acidic environments. So, you know, that's another uh, example of an innate immunity to keep our skin very acidic. Another example of innate immunity are the mucous membranes. So I'm going to talk about what actually keeps the mucous membranes healthy. The mucous membranes are those membranes that line the respiratory tract. It also lines the urinary tract, the reproductive tract, and any, um, any opening that actually can be exposed to the environment. So when you think about your mouth, your respiratory tract, your nose, your urinary system, your reproductive system, those are actually exposed to the environment. So the mucous membrane lines those organs and those cavities, and the mucous membranes are very sticky. And that's a good thing because it can trap some of these bacteria and these viruses. That's why, you know, we develop cough or we develop sneezing because we're getting those things out of our body. That's why it's important to wear a mask because if you're sneezing or you're coughing, you know, that's going into the air. And if there's an airborne pathogen that could be infectious, we're breathing that in. So that's the whole concept behind the mask. When you're wearing the mask, you're protecting me from you, <laughs> from your cough or your sneeze and vice versa. So that's why the mask is actually a very good idea. The other thing that's kind of cool is that that respiratory tract especially is lined with something called cilia. Now in your nose, you see hair. That's not actually cilia, that's hair. But if you actually look through a microscope through your um, trachea and you know the lower part of the bronchus, there's cilia, which is like this microscopic hair that actually moves. And what that does is it sweeps out bacteria out of our body and viruses and pathogens and, and um, pollens and things like that. And that's what might give us that, um, that reflex to cough or to sneeze. So that's a good thing. So mucous membranes protect us, cilia protects us. I mean, think about even the stomach. When you think about the stomach, what are we eating? We're not eating sterile food, right? So one of the first lines of defense to make sure we don't get foodborne illness would be our stomach acid. The pH of our stomach is extremely acidic, actually a pH of one or two. If you actually stuck your finger inside your stomach, it would burn um, because it has hydrochloric acid. But think about how good that is because if you're going out and you're eating even raw sushi, or you're eating food that isn't, you know, 100% sterile because no food is, your stomach is actually protecting you from foodborne illness. Um, certain enzymes in breast milk, in saliva, things like that also protect us. Even tears um, actually have an enzyme in them. And thank goodness, because our eyes are so exposed to the environment, we're getting bombarded. Um, and that's why even some of the scientists and doctors are saying, hey, I know it works. 
work, a lot of times I'm wearing my glasses um, just because when I see patients, I want to make sure that my eyes are also protected from anything infectious. Um, I had a patient today that was actually wearing goggles, so she was actually protecting herself as well. Um, but your natural tears actually help to keep your um, eyes protected from bacterial growth. And it's amazing how much we actually rub our eyes. It's only until we say to everybody, don't rub your face, don't touch your face, wash your hands. And then you realize, oh my goodness, I touch my face all the time. I don't know, maybe I'm just talking about myself. Um, more examples of innate immunity are even when you urinate and when you have bowel movement. <laughs> That actually helps to eliminate viruses and bacteria. So that's why, you know, if you've ever gone to the doctor for the flu and they don't even give you antibiotics, they just say, keep drinking plenty of fluids. And you're thinking, why do I have to drink plenty of fluids? That's one of the reasons why. When you're drinking plenty of fluids, um, when you're having urination and bowel movements, that actually helps to slough off viruses and bacteria out of our body. So these are just examples of innate immunity that actually we don't have to do anything about it. It's just naturally part of who we are. Now, the process of immunity also involves something called uh, natural killer cells and phagocytosis and something called macrophages. So I want to show you this cell. It's the most amazing thing. This is what it looks like. It really does kind of look like this. I don't know if you remember from Bio 101 back in the day when we learned about amoebas. Remember those? It actually looks like an amoeba, but it's not an amoeba. It's actually a macrophage. It's a white blood cell but it moves throughout our body. It's the most amazing cell because it scavenges. It goes around and it tries to look for things that it doesn't like. It looks for viruses and it looks for bacteria. It even looks for cancer cells and pollen, things that would make us sick. And when it finds it, it engulfs it. So this is what this picture is. It finds this creepy bacteria and then it kind of engulfs it. And as it does that, it, it kind of destroys it chemically and then kind of spits out the rest. So we want to make sure we keep our macrophages extremely strong. And what's really cool about macrophages is that this talks to the rest of the immune system. So once these macrophages get alerted to certain uh, bacteria and viruses, then our immune system is kind of awake. And it's like, okay, there's something going on and it, and it talks to it. So these natural killer cells are a type of white blood cells, the lymphocytes, and we have about 5 to 15% of our lymphocytes are killer cells. And the reason why I think these are the most amazing cells is because they can recognize viruses and tumor cells. So you might have heard about some immunotherapy for cancer treatment. Um, what they're trying to do, the scientists, through different medications and treatments, is to boost the natural killer cells. And what the natural killer cells do is when they find this noxious substance, it actually releases a chemical called interferon. And the interferon is a natural type of um, killer. And it actually kills the viruses and the bacteria by destroying their cell membranes. It's kind of cool. The inflammatory response is also part of the immune system. Now, an inflammatory response can also be a bad thing. But in this case, this is just an example if you had a cut. It causes a lot of inflammation of the tissue. And what the body is trying to do is actually seal the opening. So in that sense, it's a good thing. And once you have that inflammatory response, all of these macrophages go to the area. And then again, your immune system is alerted. Okay, so what we're really talking about with some of these viruses like, you know, chicken pox virus or flu virus, COVID virus, things that have even a vaccine, what we're looking at is something called an antigen specific reaction. In other words, your immune system is recognizing the proteins that are produced by that particular virus or bacteria. And what's really cool about the immune system is that it has memory. So if we were exposed to that same or similar type of virus, our immune system wakes up a lot quicker than if it was, a, you know, that was the first time we were ever exposed to it. And that's why COVID was so dangerous, right? In the beginning, they call it a novel virus because we were not exposed to this. It, it's, it's something completely new to our immune system. And our immune system takes e even a couple of weeks to produce antibodies. So within that couple of weeks, people are decompensating. They're actually getting very sick because our immune system was not able to catch up and actually um, kill the virus. 
So the adaptive immune response is actually the antibodies or the B cells, which again are a type of white blood cell. So that's where we are now with this COVID virus. We're trying to identify if people have antibodies to it. We just still don't know a lot about COVID um, and if these antibodies actually um, stay for a long time or if they go to sleep and go away. Um, so it's gonna be interesting to see as we progress through um, what happens. And of course, if we can get a vaccine eventually, what the vaccine is going to do once we get the vaccine, it actually uh, wakes up that immune system and has those antibodies on guard just in case we get exposed to it. That's why vaccines are, are very important. All right, so these are just some of the um, different um, antibodies. So we don't have one class of antibody. You actually have one, two, three, four, five different types of antibodies. Now, IgE is the antibody that, um, if you've ever had an allergic reaction, the IgE is the antibody that's responsible for giving you all those terrible symptoms. IgG is something that confirms, confers long-term protection. IgM would be something that would be activated pretty much right away. That would be the antibody that you would see if you were exposed to something. Um, IgA is something um, that you also see. IgD, you don't really see. I don't think this one is being activated through COVID. Okay, so activation of the T cells occurs first with the macrophages. So that's the top domino. Let's get the macrophages activated and then it calls upon the T cells and the B cells. The T cells have those natural killer cells and the B cells produce the antibodies. So we're actually having, you know, double whammy to try to help us. So that's what these are, just to remind you. Okay, but what can actually hurt the immune system? You know, as you guys know, I work with a population that, you know, a surgical population. I also work with um, patients that have obesity and morbid obesity. And what we found is that those that suffer from overweight and obesity actually had a greater risk of dying from COVID. Um, and I, thank goodness I haven't had any patients die of it, um, but I know some of my colleagues have. And why is that? Body fat actually suppresses the immune system. It actually causes a, um, a dysfunction of the immune system. And of course, that is what protects us. So excess body fat actually lowers the amount of macrophages, and that's awful. Remember, the macrophages are those scavengers that are looking for diseases to kill it, um, and that's what actually activates the whole immune system. So body fat will suppress that. And once you suppress those, then you're suppressing the antibodies, you're suppressing the T cells, you're suppressing the natural killer cells. So that's why we say excessive body fat is an immunosuppressive. Um, believe it or not, excessive body fat also inhibits the effectiveness of vaccinations. Um, I don't know if we've actually looked into a study if they needed a higher dosage. I don't think so. I think we give them the same dosage for a patient that might be you know, 300 pounds as opposed to 150 pounds. I think they get the same dosage, but their reaction to it wouldn't be the same. Um, also, excessive body fat causes that inflammation, but the bad type of inflammation, the inflammation that, again, causes a suppression of the immune system and oxidative stress. There are studies that show that excessive body fat increases our risk to not just COVID, but other diseases like tuberculosis, the flu, even um, stomach ulcers, which is created by helicobacter, which is a bacteria. And there are lots of studies to show that if you are hospitalized for whatever reason, maybe you just needed, you know, a easy surgery. If you have obesity or overweight or you're over fat, that actually will increase your risk of what we call nosocomial infections. A nosocomial infection means you picked up an infection at the hospital. And I know that's why a lot of people are afraid to go to the hospital right now, especially with COVID. But I can tell you just especially in my area, our hospitals are being so diligent with our procedures. Um, we probably should have been even this diligent before COVID. So I feel pretty confident. So I know I've shown this slide before. Um, following your age and your gender is what actually tells you what, what's the healthy range of your body fat. So I fall within this range, 41 to 60. 
use. So I need to be between a 23 to 35 percent. So I think it's, you know, what's the message here? I think the message here is we're all concerned about our weight, especially nowadays. Some of us might be gaining weight during COVID, but you know, what is weight? What is that number? You need to look at the body fat. You know, if you're working out and you're building muscle, your actual total weight might be going up and that's okay because you're building muscle. But if you're not working out, but you're gaining weight and you're building body fat, that's going to have an adverse reaction to your immune system and other things, of course. So get to the fitness center whenever you can to get your body fat measured because that's really important. Oh, just a little humor there. Don't forget, you are what you eat. So I need to eat a skinny person. Mm. I know you're all laughing. I can hear you. <laughs> okay, so if you need to lose weight because your body fat is too high, you know, you don't have to go crazy about it. What you need to do is even just losing 5 to 15% of your excessive body fat actually improves your health profile, including your immune system. So that's, it's all about, you know, what should we do to lose weight? Well, lifestyle modification. You know, the next lecture that I'm doing after this one is I'm going to be talking about quarantine 15 um, because the average amount of weight gain over this past three months with COVID pandemic has been about 15 pounds, believe it or not. And I can tell you a lot of my patients, even one today, again, she's gained about seven pounds. I can tell you I've probably gained probably close to five pounds myself. Um, a lot of for a lot of reasons. Um, so we got to get back on track with our diet and our exercise. You got to look at your calories. You have to self-monitor. Try to be as active as you can. If you can get to the fitness center, that's great. Uh, whatever you can do at home, that's going to be really important. But we can't, we can't allow quarantine or you know, changes of our outdoor lifestyle kind of ruin our body weight. So this is just the wheel of long-term success, physical activity, whatever you can do, even at home. You got to cook smart or order smart, uh, plan and shop smart. I know when we first started this COVID, my goodness, everybody was going out to Publix and buying things they don't typically buy, like potato chips and cheese its and all, all these things. So you have to think, you know, we got to get rid of that stuff. Uh, eat slow and drink slow so you will be full longer. Um, avoid or limit the alcohol. There are statistics to show that um, alcohol sales have actually increased by about 55%. So we are actually drinking a, a little bit more. I Eat breakfast, don't skip meals, definitely portion control. Get support. I know that, you know, it's just been really hard um, because I love technology and thank goodness I can talk to you guys, but I really am like a touchy feely person. I miss, you know, hugging you and seeing you and having that face to face interaction. So it really has been pretty psychological for all of us. Self monitor for sure, that's really important. And that also motivates you to pick the right foods um, and just don't drink your calories and definitely make sure you're eating all of your macronutrients, but not one of them in excess. Unfortunately, most of us eat carbs in excess. All right, so really what's the gist of this lecture? What foods and nutrients will boost your immune system naturally because that's what we wanna do? Well, the first nutrient is things that have vitamin A. Vitamin A is an amazing vitamin because it's an antioxidant. So not only that, it protects your cells, but it also helps to develop that mucus barrier that I talked about. You want to keep that mucus barrier really strong so it traps those bacteria. And it also influences the function of the natural killer cells, the T cells, and the B cells. So it doesn't mean you all need to go out and get a vitamin A, like over-the-counter vitamin. You don't need to do that. Um, if you are taking a vitamin, it most likely has vitamin A in it. Uh, we don't need that much to, to be healthy. But of course, I'd rather you get it from food. Now, what's interesting about vitamin A is you can get vitamin A in two different ways. The first way is to actually get vitamin A, the actual vitamin, and that's actually called a preformed retinoid. That's vitamin A. And you would get that in foods like liver, if you eat chicken liver or calves liver. I don't know too many people that eat kidneys, but if you do, um, eggs and dairy. So when you eat those types of food, you're actually eating vitamin A. 
But the bulk of our vitamin A comes some, from something called a provitamin, which are the carotenoids. And those would be found in our brightly colored fruits and vegetables in a form called beta carotene. So beta carotene is a pigment in fruits and vegetables that can actually convert to vitamin A. Okay, so you don't have to go out and eat liver and kidneys. You really don't, I promise. Just make sure you eat your carrots and your papayas and your broccoli and your spinach and things like that. This is just an example. Like, look at this, carrots. And this is for three and a half ounces. 835 retinol equivalents of vitamin A, so very high. Kale, sweet potato, butternut, uh, mustard greens, spinach. So that's where you can get the bulk of your vitamin A from, your fruits and vegetables, brightly colored fruits and vegetables. Now, another nutrient that boosts the immune system is vitamin D. I know we know vitamin D as something to protect our bones, but it also is what we call an immunomodulator. It actually controls the communication of our immune system. It also decreases the bad cells that cause the inflammation, the cytokines. So it also helps to decrease that. Now, Unfortunately, most of us have a vitamin D deficiency because even if we are out in the sun, because it is the sunshine vitamin, it is a vitamin that we can actually make, um, what are we telling you? When you go out in the sun, you got to wear sunscreen. And when you wear sunscreen, you can't really absorb those rays to make vitamin D. So if you need to take vitamin D, just make sure your doctor is giving you some guidance on that. What are Sources of vitamin D, believe it or not, there's not too many natural sources of vitamin D. Eggs, salmon, shiitake mushrooms, cheese, those have vitamin D, but mostly our food is fortified with vitamin D. So if you're eating cereals and grains and oatmeal, it's usually fortified with vitamin D. Um, so vitamin D is really important. Cod liver oil, I know we used to do that. I don't know too many people that do that anymore. But here's a good example. So pink salmon, three ounces, you get 530 international units. That's pretty good. Sardines, one of my favorite, 231. So these fish are really good. You might as well get bang for your buck if you're going to eat fish. Um, some of the oatmeal, milk is fortified. Soy milk, if you don't drink milk. And even orange juice, they're fortifying these things. Cereal, egg yolks. The next nutrient that boosts the immune system is vitamin E. Now, vitamin E, I know some people that actually buy vitamin E because they like to put it on their skin. Um, hey, it makes your skin nice and soft, but you know what? You want to also heal from the inside, so you actually want to eat vitamin E. Vitamin E is an antioxidant, and it also improves the function of those natural killer cells, and it also helps to enhance that cell communication. Now, most of us don't have a vitamin E deficiency because we Americans eat a lot of oil, and that's where you get most of your vitamin E. You get vitamin E in your nuts and your seeds and your oils. So most of us get enough of it. If you're taking a multivitamin, it's usually in it. Um, again, egg, egg, especially the egg yolk, is very good, a good source of vitamin E. Um, wheat germ. So if you like wheat germ, uh, wheat germ is so good for you. It's very high in vitamin E. You can sprinkle that in your yogurt or your cereal, your oatmeal, um, your salad, but it's a very good source of vitamin E. And like I said, any of the oils. So wheat germ oil, your, um, your nuts, your seeds. Um, some vegetables have vitamin E as well, but not as much. Okay, but this is a good example. So again, most of us get enough vitamin E. Now, vitamin B12, I love vitamin, I love talking about vitamin B12 only because as we get older, um, we start to lose vitamin B12 naturally. Now, vitamin B12 is a vitamin that's found in all animal products. So unless you're a vegan, you're probably eating enough B12. But unfortunately, as we get older, our ability to absorb it actually changes just because of the aging process. Vitamin B12 is really important for our red blood cells. It helps to prevent anemia, and it also helps to protect our, um, our nerve tissue, so it prevents peripheral neuropathy. But B12 is also an immunomodulator, and it enhances the development and function of the T cells and natural killer cells. So vitamin B12 is something I always encourage my patients over 50 years old to get tested, um, just because, again, 
again, you might be eating animal products because you're not a vegan, and yet your B12 might actually be suboptimal. So if you haven't had your B12 tested lately, ask your doctor to test it. If you need to take a supplement, you don't really need to take very high doses, even though vitamin B12 is a very abused vitamin because um, some doctors give injections like every week with B12, which I think is overkill. Um, some trainers will do that as well. And if you go to the farm, you'll see that B12 is found in very high doses, like 2,400 micrograms. I mean, very high. And we don't need to take really high doses. So this is just an example um, for three, three ounces of clams. Who would have guessed that? Clams are very high in vitamin B12, mussels, crabs. So if you do shellfish, that's pretty high. But again, any kind of animal product will have B12 in it. Now, vitamin C, I know that most of us are very familiar with vitamin C because everybody takes it during the flu season. It is an antioxidant. And what it's actually doing as well is improving and strengthening the function of the natural killer cells and the lymphocytes. And it strengthens that chemotaxis. Chemotaxis means that natural ability, um, that chemical that actually kills the viruses and the bacteria. Now, the one thing I want to caution you about, though, with vitamin C is we only really need about 75 milligrams if you're female, 90 milligrams if you're men. If you're smokers, you need more. So if you do smoke, um, I usually encourage my patients to have about 200 to 250 milligrams per day. But for those of us that are overdosing on vitamin C, let me just mention that. There are, you know, you can get a thousand milligrams of vitamin C and even higher. And I don't really recommend that because vitamin C is also called ascorbic acid. So it is a very acidic vitamin. So if you have any kind of reflux or GERD or ulcers or irritable bowel sy syndrome, that can actually irritate your digestive tract. Also, if you have history of kidney stones, excessive vitamin C could also exacerbate that. So again, vitamin C is not um, you know, something that you wanna go crazy with the dosage. So how about let's look at food that has vitamin C, because rarely will you overdose on vitamin C from a food. We all know the citrus fruit contains it, but I have to tell you things like kiwi fruits, um, strawberries, peppers, those things have even higher amounts of vitamin C than citrus fruit. Um, Brussels sprouts, tomatoes, cauliflower, you know, so these are all good sources of vitamin C. Here's just some other examples. Look at this, hot green chili peppers. Whew, hot, hot, ugh, too hot. But it's very high in vitamin C, 242. That's pretty good. Your guava, so your peppers, your apples, broccoli. So again, your fruits and vegetables naturally contain high levels of vitamin C. Another um, vitamin that I wanna, um, give you attention to is something called folic acid. Now, folic acid, we, we always encourage our pregnant ladies to have folic acid because it's very good for the development of the fetus to make sure they don't have any um, birth defects. And then some of our cardiologists are take, telling patients, um, hey, if you have heart disease, you might need more folic acid because folic acid also helps to reduce something called homocysteine, which actually can hurt your heart. But folic acid is also needed for the immune system. And what it does is it strengthens the antibodies. Now, most of us don't need, again, to take a separate folic acid. If you are taking a multivitamin, it usually has enough in it. You only need about 400 micrograms. And this is another vitamin that I do not recommend to overdose on because if you take more than 1,000 micrograms of folic acid, it will interfere with vitamin B12. So you think you're doing yourself one favor by having folic acid, but then you're reducing the B12, which would also have a deleterious effect. So that's why there are always ranges. So let's look at, at food. Well, what's interesting is that the animal products are actually very poor sources of folate. So if you're eating fruits and vegetables, that's where you'll get your folate. So how cool is that? The body's just such an amazing thing. So if you're eating animal products, you're getting good, good amounts of B12. And if you're getting your fruits and vegetables, you're going to get your folic acid. And again, you're probably not going to eat too much broccoli where it's going to interfere with your B12. So, you know, hey, get bang for your buck. If you're eating 
eating your oranges and your green leafy vegetables, not only are you getting your folic acid, you're getting your vitamin C, you're getting your vitamin A, you're getting your vitamin E, so you're getting all of these these vitamins that are going to strengthen your immune system. Again, this just, I don't know, I guess they like liver, but okay, 250 micrograms of folic acid in beef liver, that's pretty high. Uh, some of your legumes, your peas, avocado, okay, so it's readily available in your fruits and vegetables. Now, iron, what's interesting about iron is that iron is needed for healthy red blood cells. That we know because iron um, is part of hemoglobin and hemoglobin is needed by the red blood cells to carry oxygen throughout your body. But who would have thought? Iron also enhances the macrophages and the neutrophils. The neutrophils are another type of white blood cell and it also enhances the growth of the lymphocytes. So iron is not just needed for red blood cells Cells, it's also needed for white blood cells as well. The only problem with iron is just be careful because if you are taking supplements of iron, I always tell my patients, make sure you keep iron supplements out of the reach of kids because this is actually the number one cause of poisoning with kids in the United States. And now with all of these gummy vitamins, it always makes me nervous. So just keep your iron supplements you know, in a place that your, your grandkids or kids can't get to them. We don't really need that much iron, only about five milligrams for females and six milligrams for men. But let's get it from our food. So iron comes in two forms something called heme iron and something called non-heme iron. So the difference is heme iron comes from animal products, your steak, your chicken, your fish, your pork, etc., And that is readily absorbable by the human body. But if you're a vegetarian or you have more of a plant-based diet, you can still get iron from, I don't know why they put eggs on this side. Eggs should be on this side. But you can get iron from nuts, from your raisins, from whole grains, your dark leafy vegetables. And look at that, chocolate. Another good reason to eat chocolate, right? Um, but unfortunately, the non-heme iron is not as absorbable by the human body. So if you're doing, say, whole grains, like or, or spinach, all right, just an example. Just say you have this beautiful spinach salad and you think, oh, right, I'm getting a lot of iron from my spinach, you know, like Popeye, right? Unfortunately, you're really not absorbing the iron from your spinach salad. So the best thing to do is kind of make it acidic, you know, throw in some strawberries or some kiwi fruit or put some balsamic vinegar because iron needs to kind of be in the acidic form for the body to absorb it. So there are ways to manipulate it. This is just an example. So your lentils, 11.2, but again, it's not gonna be very absorbable. So put a little balsamic vinegar in there, your cocoa powder, pumpkin seeds. So that's just an example. Oh, more examples. All right, now zinc. Now, the thing with zinc is I know during the flu season, everybody goes out and they buy, they buy the Zycam or they buy extra zinc. Um, zinc actually helps to enhance the development of those natural killer cells and also the macrophages and the B cells and the neutrophils. And it also protects the epithelial cells too. So it's a really wonderful mineral. The problem is, is if you take too much zinc, it's going to interfere with your iron. So again, you have to be careful, even in things that like Zycam, things that contain the zinc. You don't need that much zinc, 6.8 or 9.4. You don't need that much. So again, get it in food. So I think I'm giving myself um, excuses to eat dark chocolate, but here you go. Dark chocolate will have zinc as well as the iron, uh, garlic, pumpkin seeds, sesame seeds, wheat germ. Oh, there you go. Eat your wheat germ. So you're going to get vitamin E and zinc. Um, squash seeds? I don't know too many people that eat squash seeds, but hey, why not? Chickpeas, watermelon seeds. Okay. This is just some more examples. So your wheat germ, I think that's great. Some of your animal, your steak, your shiitake mushrooms. Hey, if you eat shiitake mushrooms, you're going to get your zinc and your vitamin D, your um, shellfish. So as you can see, what's wonderful about food is that food is going to have a variety of all these vitamins and minerals that we need. Um, so that's why a variety of food is always a good thing. Now, selenium is also another mineral. It is an antioxidant, and this enhances the function of the neutrophils and also the T cells and the B cells, which make our antibodies, and it also strengthens the macrophages. 
it's not really something that you have to go and take as a separate supplement. Rarely do I see a selenium deficiency, not in this country anyway. Um, you need about 45 micrograms, which would be in your multivitamin. And again, if you're eating animal products, you're mostly like most likely eating enough of them. If you like nuts, Brazilian nuts are very high in selenium. Um, I think that's one of the better nuts. Only eat about six of them though, because they have 200 calories. 200 calories in six nuts. That's a lot of calories. Um, so just be careful with that. But eggs, look at that. So if you are an egg eater, eggs have zinc, selenium, vitamin E, vitamin A. I mean, you know, vitamin D. Uh, if you're eating chicken, you're getting, you know, you're getting your nutrients. Oh, wow, I went through that really fast. So really the take home message is if you have excessive body fat, work on it, okay? So, you know, if you, if you find that you've gained weight, if you gain muscle mass, it's not a problem. If you gain body fat mass, one of the goals is to try to get rid of some of that body fat because that in and of itself is going to strengthen your immune system. And then increase your variety of foods and definitely incorporate as much fruits and vegetables as you can. Um, Plant-based is always good, but also the proteins, the animal foods are also important as well because you'll get your B12 iron from that. You'll get zinc from that. Um, so definitely have a variety of foods as well. Um, I think, remember, we don't live in a sterile environment. We're not going to live in a bubble. Uh, one day, we're going to take off these masks, I think. Um, hopefully, we'll keep with our washing of our hands. Hopefully, we'll keep that habit. But I think slowly but surely, we're going to go back to um, maybe not back to the way we were for a while, because I think we're going to all be very self-conscious. But remember, we don't live in a sterile environment. We don't eat sterile food. So we have to keep ourselves strong from the inside out, okay? Because when it's not COVID, it's going to be something else. And of course, I always end my lectures with my furry son. So you know that that's the end of my lecture. <laughs> So I hope you enjoyed it. I know I talk really fast. I guess I got very excited about the topic, um, but I guess we're going to unmute people. So if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. That was fun. And some people are outside. I love that. It's raining here, so I can't be outside. All right. So what questions do you have? Any questions for me? No. No questions. I saw her in the uh, gym, you know, in the, uh, the Ray exercise, maybe her picture or something. Yeah. So um, everybody, everybody's eating healthy? You're having your fruits and vegetables? Yeah? Yes. All mm -hmm. right. I like to hear that. Excellent. Any questions? Any questions? How much chocolate? Will she hear me? How much chocolate? <laughs> yes. How much oh, are you? I love that question. Thank you. Okay, so remember that if you're going to eat chocolate, do get bang for your buck. Make sure you do the dark chocolate or the, you know, the cocoa powder. Higher the percentage of cacao, the higher the antioxidant. So it's got to be at least 70% cacao, which is pretty bitter. And then the required amount yeah. is one ounce. So it's not much. It's one ounce. Mm. Yeah, it's not much. The size of a kiss. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It's not much. But, you know, the, the other way that you can do it even, you know, and really get really bang for your buck is do the unsweetened cocoa powder. And then you can put that in soups, in stews, in your oatmeal, in your protein oh, shakes. Chocolate? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Hey, that's what the Moroccans do, right? Other cultures, you'll use it as a spice. You know, it's, it's actually um, India, in India, they use it also as a spice because that's what it is. It's a spice. Uh, you can uh -huh. put it in your coffee, put it in your tea. Yeah. 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 All right. Thank you. Well, you're very welcome. My pleasure. <laughs> Excellent, you guys. That was so much fun. I miss seeing you so much, but just stay safe. And I really appreciate you guys logging in and inviting me into your house to listen to the lectures. Um, and I think next month we're going to talk about food allergies because that's another big problem that I'm seeing, food allergies. So we're going to talk about that.
but can I ask a question? Please. Um, how do you recommend a certain amount of caloric intake per day, or is it just okay. based on like your, you know, if you're a guy or girl, etc.? Uh, which wait, I missed that first part. How much? Do, do you recommend a certain amount of calorie, like a caloric intake? Oh, calories. Okay, so calories would be based on what your goals are. So if you're trying to maintain your weight or you're trying to gain weight or lose weight, that's how you manipulate the calories. So just for a general equation, if you want to maintain your weight, you take your weight in kilograms because everything is the metric system, right? So you take your weight in kilograms and multiply by um, 20, 20 to 25. That would kind of, no, sorry, that would actually help you to lose weight. If you multiply by 25 to 30, then that actually maintains your weight. And then if you want to gain weight, you multiply by 35 to 40. So it all depends on what your goals are. You know, if you look at the American guidelines, they just, just give general guidelines, like women to eat a 2,000 calorie diet. I'm sorry, but most of my patients, if they ate 2,000 calorie diet, they'd be gaining weight. So I don't usually put my patients on a 2,000 calorie diet unless they're very athletic and they're, you know, competing. Um, so it's a, it's a loaded question because it's very individual based on what your goals are. I know I went around in a circle. Did I answer your yeah, question so, at all? <laughs> yeah, so multiply it by 25 to 30 and to regulate and 35 to 40 to gain. Correct, correct. And of course, when you increase the calories, of course, you want to make sure that you're eating the percentage of calories from proteins, fats, and carbs. And of course, the whole grains, you know, you don't want to do, do the potato chips and all right. the chocolate like some of us are doing. I won't mention me, right? <laughs> so, so let's uh, multiply 150 pounds times 0.20. Is that how it goes? Okay. Um, you have to convert here. I'll, I'll get my calculator because okay. I can't do any math. You know that. So I need my... Okay. So 150 pounds, you have to convert to kilograms. So you have to divide that by 2.2. So that would be 68 kilograms. So if I had a patient that wanted to lose weight, I multiply it by about 20, and that's about a 1,300 calorie diet if they wanted to lose weight. Oh, okay, okay. So uh, you have to divide it by 2.2. Correct. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, you guys. Well, I do want to thank Jamie for being our moderator and controller of the Zoom. <laughs> she no does problem. such a good also, job. <laughs> I just want to let everybody know because there were some questions about the recording of this. Um, we will get it up on our YouTube page. It's our Glen Eagles page. So if you go to Glen Eagles Country Club, we do have a separate, um, if you go on there, there's playlists. So we have one for fitness. We do have one for nutrition. So Lillian's first one oh, is in great. there. Um, mm -hmm. We sent out an email with that, uh, that link recently but tomorrow we're going to get this one to marketing and hopefully it'll be up on that page by the end of the day tomorrow oh, cool. um but i will send out a link with that as well so we we do have this recording so you can watch it again you can watch it every single day <laughs> <laughs> why wouldn't you <laughs> why wouldn't you right oh you guys thank you so much for spending time with me and i will see you next month thank you be Selena. safe okay you're very welcome Mwah. Miss you guys. Bye, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 <laughs>